This week on Pulse, a look at the basics of joining a gym and some warm-up techniques to get you started. But first up, a game of strength, power, speed and agility, volleyball, up next on Pulse. Volleyball is a high intensity, high impact, exclusive, non-contact sport. The dimension of the court, it is 9 by 18, 9 meters on either side, and when you put the both sides together, it is 18 meters in length. The weight of the ball is 4 point five pounds. The height of the net for men is 2.43 meters, whereas for ladies is 2.24 meters. This coin is done via a system called rally point. Rally point in volleyball means every time you make a mistake, the opposing team wins the point. In volleyball, you have to win three sets in order to win a game. It is best out of five, so the team who wins three sets first, wins the game. The first four sets of a volleyball game can offer 25 points or two points clear, meaning if two teams end up on 24, all, they must score at least two points clear in order to win the game, so you could go up to 100 points. They don't necessarily have to go to four or five sets, they could finish in three sets. A team could win a game three to zero. In the fifth set, however, the game finishes at 15. If the both teams are on 14 all, it only could go up to 17 points. Each team you need 12 players per team, but at each time there's only six players could play on, on either side of the court. Right? So you'd have a bench of six players on, on the court, six players. Volleyball court is divided into six positions. Position one is the service area. Position two is the right front of the court. Position three is the middle part of the court. Position four is the left front of the court. Position 5 is the left back of the court and position 6 is the middle back of the court. In volleyball, as fast as you gain a point, you rotate in a clockwise direction. So the person who is in position 6, having gained a point, they rotate to position 5. Person 5 goes to 4, 4 goes to 3, 3 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1 and likewise and they rotate in a clockwise direction, however, but the positions are numbered in anti-clockwise. To initiate the, the actual play, you need to serve. So the team that is serving, you have two options of service. You can stand up and either throw the ball, or you can do it in most cases that it is being done now, which is jump serve. Throw the ball into the air, jump and attack the ball over the net. also have the setting that is like a quarterback in a game of a football. That the person who distributes the ball, he's the person who sets for the other players who comes in now to attack the ball, volley the ball from here. All right, this is what the setters do most time. The setters do this right through actually. Then you have blocking, which is the first line of defense. Block by penetrating with your both arms over the net preferably. have the defending now which is which comprises either bumping the ball or volleying in defense. Right? Most time you dig the ball in defense from a hard attack. Right? That is where the specialist defender comes in most times. That is the libero. This here is what we call the forearm pass. In volleyball we call it bumping. Right? This is the most controlled part of the actual playing of the ball. Pancake, that is a 
last attempt to get the ball. It's not one of your most controlled play, but in the, if for some reason that you're caught off guard, you could use that as a last ditch attempt to really get at the ball. The game has become so fast in recent years that we have since implemented the leg in terms of playing the ball. Sometimes in defense, because of the power that the, the attackers hit the ball with, sometimes yeah, as a referee are unable to tell whether or not the ball was played with the hand or the leg. So now they actually implemented the leg in terms of playing the ball. So you could run down a ball and kick it if anything in defense also. So those are the areas. Or the ball could hit any part of the body, but for more control, you'd use the set areas that was called before. Next on Pulse, more on training, injuries and diet in the sport of volleyball. important in terms of attacking the ball. You would want to drop the wrist on the ball so that you wouldn't hit the ball outside because you're playing in a small area as mentioned before. So you need to get control. So the wrist plays a very integral part in controlling in attack and also in blocking the ball. You need to drop the wrist at all times. Sometimes in blocking the ball, if you don't position your hand properly, you can even get the wrist damage also. So it is important. The wrist is important. Knee pads and knee bands. Knee bands are really and truly to prevent from getting any excessive knee injuries. Knee pads are also there to prevent from getting any burns and stuff. Um, there are players that would use elbow bands, I think to probably prevent from actually getting any elbow injuries in terms of the constant attacking of the ball. This, the shoes that is more get towards volleyball is a shoes with a flatter surface to the bottom. No big set of rules. Understand? Because of the set of sharp movements you have to do to the side and then jumping. Basketball shoes could also be used once you have your ankle brace and thing with it also. It also has to be light and very absorbing in terms of shock like for the jumping and thing constant jumping. The injuries common to volleyballers are ankle injuries, toe injuries, knee injuries, shoulder injuries, back injury. Right? But I consider injury like an accident. You don't really plan to get an accident, so therefore you are required to try your best to safeguard yourself from such injuries. Knee, shoulder, ankle are the most dominant ones in the game of volleyball because they do a lot of jumping, so therefore a lot of pressure is be placed on the knee. And because of the close contact, sometimes like when you're going to attack the ball and the blocker's blocking, sometimes you come down on a man, so your ankle now comes into play. And because you had to actually attack the ball every time, shoulder takes a lot of work. Sometimes the back also. Um, in terms of who the players are more exposed to those type of injuries, it's more so the outside attackers. They are called upon to really actually carry more of the load and thing in the game of volleyball. All right, so they do a lot of attacking at the ball. And sun jump in front, back line, and even save it. In my career, I, I have been in it over 14 years now, and I have only sustained one injury to date, probably because of hard bones. But for those persons who, who might be so fortunate, <laughs> my name is Nolan Injury Tash. <laughs> just a little joke there. Um, yes, I have had all the injuries that associated with a volleyball player. You name it, I have had it. Six. Seven ankle injuries to date, both knees, heel, toe, shoulder, thumb, um, elbow, you name it, I have it. <laughs> In terms of training, I emphasize a lot on jumping and squat training. We also look at the shoulders and the calves 
A lot of power, a lot of persons take the car for granted, but a lot of explosive power is within the car, so we do a lot of calveries, right? We also subscribe to going to the gym and doing weight training, not bulk training, weight training to, to strengthen the muscles. My specific type of training would be more based on shoulders because of the amount of attacks that I normally have to do in a game. I play outside one, outside attacker. The main attacker on the team most times. So I'd work a lot of pull-ups, shoulder press and stuff. Um, I do a lot of calf raising because in the legs, I can't go as heavy on the legs as I would like to because of the knee injuries and things. So I do a lot of calves in order to compensate for that. Um, I do a number of abdominals, also hyperextension for the back because these areas need to be also strengthened and balanced, well balanced in order to really actually be an effective volleyball player. Off season, you also want to do a lot of icing also because the muscles and the joints will be under a lot of pressure because they're up in your actual program at that point. During the peak season where condition is actually in the air, I think you want to go light weights if you're doing weights at all. But more skill work, more ball work, more court time in terms of actual skill work and things on the court. Less endurance work in terms of running or heavy weights and stuff. Um, basically, that is how you would want to incorporate it, your training. That plays an integral part of any athlete's career in terms of arm. Um, you try to take in a lot of protein because the muscles would be under severe work. So in order to assist in repair of the muscles and stuff, you try to take in a lot of meats, beans and stuff. Um, carbohydrates is also good too. Cheating that? Yeah, we do that every day, man. We eat some junk food in between. <laughs>one of the first things you want to do before joining a gym is ask for a tour. Hi. Hello, I'd like to have a tour. Remember, you may be spending a few hours a week here, not to mention some of your hard-earned dollars. So you'll want to make sure that the gym you choose caters to your fitness goals. At today's gyms, there is a variety of equipment to meet your fitness needs. While on tour, here are some things you should look for. A good gym will have everything separated into sections, so it should be easy for you to navigate your way through. There should be a cardio area. Some of the machines you will find here are treadmills, bikes, and step machines. There should also be a weight training area. Here you will find an array of machines to target every body part. On your walkthrough, be sure to look for well-maintained equipment. Safety is important, 
so you don't want to see any frayed cables or defective machines. There should be adequate space and equipment should be placed as such to avoid injuries or accidents. A good facility will also have an area where you can find racked equipment with free weights, both in the dumbbell or barbell variety. Most gyms have a circuit training area where you can do a complete workout in minimum time. This saves you time in your busy schedule. There should also be a room or some floor space set aside for group workouts like spin or aerobics. This room can also be used for stretch classes, yoga or private sessions with trainers. It is also important to note where your water coolers and restrooms are. Let's take a look at some additional things to consider when joining a gym. Once you have investigated all avenues and you like what you see, the next step is to sign up as a member. You will be required to fill out a form with your name, age and contact information. It is also advised that you work with a certificate from a qualified medical practitioner, declaring you fit to begin an exercise program, especially if you suffer with any ailments or injuries like back problems, knee injuries or cardiovascular problems. Before you start working out, it's a good idea to have certain measurements taken. The staff at the gym will be able to measure and record your weight and body fat percentage. This will enable you to properly track your progress over time. All of this information is important. It enables the trainers at the gym to tailor a proper program to help you reach your fitness goals. Finally, here are some items you must take with you to the gym. After the break, we'll show you some basic warm-up techniques. One of the things you must do before you work out is warm-up. I'm going to show you different ways to do a basic warm-up to get you ready for your workout routine. The most convenient way to warm-up is your cardiovascular or aerobic exercises. The treadmill is an excellent machine to use for your warm-up. When mounting a treadmill, be sure to stand on the sides of the machine, not on the belt, and straddle forward. Most pieces of cardio equipment have preset programs to help you meet your goals. However, for the warm-up session, it's best to stick with the manual program, which allows you to gradually adjust the intensity. Choose an appropriate program, start the machine, and carefully step on the belt. Take a few moments to get used to the speed. Once you feel comfortable, let go of the handrails. It is best to start at the lowest speed, and in five to 15 minutes, gradually work your way up to a pace where you break a sweat. Step heel to toe using long, full, even strides and try to stay in the center of the belt. Maintain an upright posture and keep your shoulders relaxed. Breathing should be smooth and rhythmic, in through the nose and out through the mouth. Always look forward, never behind, or to the sides. This throws off your balance. If you lose your balance, take hold of the handrails. When you stop the machine, keep walking until it comes to a complete stop. Place your feet on the sides, straddle back, and dismount the machine. 
When you step off the machine for the first time, you may feel dizzy or feel as if you are still moving. Some of you may experience this vertigo only once or twice. Just stop and take some time for that feeling to go away before moving on to your next exercise. A stationary bike is another piece of equipment on which you can do your warm-up. Some gyms are outfitted with two types, the classic and the recumbent. When setting up the classic bike, you want to adjust your seat so that your knees are slightly bent when the pedal is at its lowest point. The pedals should be placed under the balls of your feet, which are just after your toes. Enter your program and begin pedaling. Maintain an upright and relaxed posture. Don't round your back or hunch your shoulders forward. Setup for the recumbent is quite similar. When on a bike, remember to follow the same process as the treadmill warm-up. Gradually increase your intensity. The stationary bike is quite a good exercise because it's completely non-impact, making it ideal for people with a little excess weight. A pre-exercise warm-up can have a multitude of beneficial effects on a person's workout and consequently their overall health. The final machine I'm going to demonstrate is the step machine. Mount the step machine, placing your feet on the pedals while holding the handrail. While holding the rails, select your program. Keep a straight back with your head up and your shoulders back. The depth of your step should be between 10 to 20 centimeters. Do not lean on the rails or use it to hold yourself up. This decreases the effectiveness of the exercise. Some people experience numbness of the feet while on this machine. Lifting the feet off the step every now and again while holding the handrings will help with circulation. In order to fully reap the benefits of the time you spend exercising, you must warm up. Taking those extra few minutes to adjust to increase activity will ensure a better performance from your body and in turn will make your workout more efficient, productive and best of all, enjoyable. Remember, these are just a few of the traditional ways to do your warm-up. For strength training, you can do a few repetitions with light weight to get your muscles warmed up or do an aerobic session for 5 to 15 minutes at a low intensity. Getting and keeping fit and healthy can be quite enjoyable. Whether you're a member of a gym or take part in some sporting activity, the key thing to remember is to have fun.